we're not often taught how to process the emotions. So it's a temporary fix. Same with yoga. And so yoga becomes the drug of choice. Athletics become the drug of choice. And so when you talk about willingness, for someone to be willing to confront the deep layers of suppressed tension, if someone's experienced trauma, it can be actually re-traumatizing. And so hopefully someone finds people who are skilled, like the both of you, who understand the mind-body connection, who understand the deeper connection between athletics or yoga and some of our psychological fractures to just suggest willingness might be a step too quickly. Just learning how to ground and be with breath and sensation is massive. Welcome back to the Yogi Triathlete Podcast. This is the place where we share stories of people looking, finding, and living their purpose. I'm Jess, your host, and along with my co-host, BJ, we are on a mission to create a better world. With brave intent, we are waking up and shaking up the world of endurance sports through mindset training steeped in the ancient teachings of yoga and awareness of the vibrancy of a plant-based diet and its benefits that we believe not only positively affect our athletics, but the entire world. We see the hope, you guys, we feel the beauty, and we hold great vision for the uprising of humanity. I am beyond honored by the presence of our guests today. Sean Korn is one of the most celebrated yoga teachers on this globe. She is known for her social and political activism, and most recently, her first book, Revolution of the Soul, Awaken to Love Through Raw Truth, Radical Healing, and Conscious Action. I have read this book, gone back in for more, and I'm now currently fighting with BJ as to who gets to listen to it on our Audible account. Sean opens up the doors to her story and the profound teachings of yoga, not just as movement on the mat, but as a way of life and a pathway to transformation. In her 25-year teaching career, Sean has graced the covers of numerous magazines. She has helped to raise millions of dollars for underserved populations and has sat across from prolific leaders in our society like Oprah Winfrey and Deepak Chopra. Sean utilizes her platform as a means to bring awareness to global issues such as human trafficking, HIV, AIDS, social justice, and animal rights. But I think that Sean will be the first person to agree that all change must start from within. Sean Korn, welcome to the show. Thank you so much. I'm very grateful to be here. I look forward to this conversation. Yes, very much so. So we love to just dive right in. Sure. Right? Mm -hmm. So what is, what is the work? What does that look like? Like, what does it look like to say everything <laughs> starts from within? How, how does, what does that even begin to look like? I, I think it's very individual. And I do believe the spiritual path meets you where you're at. So for some, the work is simply being more responsible, learning patience, presence, learning how to breathe or be in their bodies. For some, the work is confronting the, sh the shadow self and looking at insecurity and jealousy and fears, including abandonment and, and internalized rage. For some, it's going even deeper and looking at the ways we internalize belief systems that include bias and prejudice and stereotyping the ways in which we utilize our power to the expense of others. So I think that the work is something that is constantly morphing, evolving, growing, and changing as we essentially titrate our nervous system and become more accustomed to the discomfort of looking within at the attachments that we have to our ego self, our small self, and some of the belief systems that have been, that are embedded within us. And so the work is a living thing. And it's ultimately, though, about taking accountability, surrendering your limited beliefs, and moving into a deeper relationship with the divine, God, as it dwells within and dwells within all equally. You're so on point with the fact that it just, it's an ongoing story. It's always unfolding. And, and one of the things that I've come up against many times in this journey is, Oh man, I can't believe I was saying yelling that from the mountaintops 2 years ago. I would never do that now, you know, and that constant self-forgiveness that that goes along the way. But also the uh 
the ways we get tricked or we get blindfolded, it doesn't matter how long we're on the path. You know, I, let me share an experience quickly that I had yesterday where I saw something that brought up the trigger, right? Uh, and of course, right, every trigger is an opportunity to heal. And I f- felt myself close the door and move on. Mm-hmm. And I thought, w- and think, thankfully, thank God that I saw that. And I said, oh, no, that's not sitting with it. That's not feeling it. That's not breathing it. That's putting it, opening the vault, putting it in the vault and closing it back down. I guess we would call that like a bypass, right? Mm -hmm. Where we bypass. How do we start to become alert to that? Or, oh gosh, like I said, we can be so, we can be tricked, right? By the mind and the ego. But how does somebody know like when they're doing that bypass? I think that often people think that the healing path is a linear one when it's actually more of a spiral. And so our stuff, like what happened to you yesterday, it just swung back around and there you were in it. And in those moments, we have a choice. Do we react to it or respond to it? Do we approach it or reject it? And for whatever reason, in that moment, you, you chose to internalize it, old behavior, but you caught yourself quickly. You, that, and to me, that's the yoga. It's that pause between the inhale and the exhale, metaphorically. It's that space where you are able just to realize that you were bypassing, you were avoiding the opportunity and the discomfort as we do. And instead you chose to move back towards it. And I think that developing tools like yoga, meditation, prayer, therapy, the program, these are ways in which we can learn to identify the discomfort in our body, what these deeper messages are, and know that to avoid it means that it's only going to come back around again. And perhaps the next time we'll have even less willingness to approach it. The yoga practice lets us do what you did was be like, okay, there it is. Let's orient towards that. But we're not taught this. It's not in our bodies. We're taught to deflect, to deny, to suppress, repress. We're taught to internalize and numb ourselves using food, sex, drugs, alcohol, all sorts of different ways. It's not actually organic to our nervous system to orient towards the discomfort because the discomfort in the subconscious can equal violence or abandonment or death. And so what the practice, the practices give us is the opportunity to sit in the discomfort to recognize that actually what's on the other side of that discomfort is liberation. But we have to retrain our bodies, really our psychic musculature, to recognize that this is a positive thing, but we have to tolerate the discomfort. In the same way someone who is, I'm sure, an athlete knows if they don't, if they're not working out for a while and they get inert and then they get back onto their bike or whatever training and the lactic acid moves through the body, It is an awful feeling. You feel nauseous and uncomfortable in your body. And there's a thousand messages in your head that say, not worth it. Let's quit. I can't do it. I'm too old. I'm too weak. I'm too fat. Whatever the mantra is that tried to sabotage. But anyone who does this work knows that it's a part of the process, that the body has to re-regulate. It has to purify and detoxify. And that is when the mind is being challenged just to breathe, stay present, and work through it. And so bypassing is the avoidance and the tools allow us to move towards it with a sense of equilibrium and hope knowing that that's the work. Mm -hmm. Yeah. This morning, uh, we're finally allowed to get back into the ocean here in Southern California. Mm -hmm. So as of yesterday, and I haven't been in the ocean in four weeks, five weeks. And before Mm -hmm. that all winter, I'm not going in. So that relationship with waves, the unknown, the red tide that's here, which doesn't allow for clear be able to see the bottom of the ocean. I felt the hesitation this morning in meditation, just not trying to find an out, right? The old system was like, (laughs) well, maybe the red tide is not good to swim in and maybe it's too cloudy and maybe there'll be too many surfers. And they haven't even talked about dolphins or sharks yet. And, And all this stuff is like feeding through. So I found myself actually coming back to the moment, right? The moment of walking in the water. And this is me this morning, walking in the water, one wave came in, I got through. Second wave came in, I got through. Third wave sort of knocked me a little bit and I had to adjust my goggles. But that's the point where I continued on and it was calm all the way out till we got past the surf. 
And so in the past, those experiences as we're talking about would shut me down because they're comfortable. I know it. I'm so familiar with that third wave, whatever it is, knocking me down and, and okay, I need to come out of the water and just, I'll come back another day. But instead it's that fight and it's, well, maybe not a fight, but you're standing up and challenging that belief system. And that's where the yoga, like you talked about that yoga power, that power allows you to choose. And in this moment, and it takes time, right? It wasn't something I've done overnight. It's been a few years now since I've worked on this, since we moved to Southern California and I have access to the ocean, but that experience and just the experience today has up leveled the, the brain waves in my mind that allow me to have confidence that it doesn't matter all this stuff that's stirring up when it gets, when you get to that point, then you make a decision in that moment. Absolutely. And most people aren't oriented to that kind of thought process because the sensation of the, the panic or the overwhelm is so familiar that it feels safer. And so like, I'm, I always feel very forgiving to people who are on the path this way, that it makes sense why they wouldn't confront some of these limiting beliefs. It didn't take a day for those limiting beliefs to become embodied. It's actually historical, ancestral, cultural, and it's not going to take five minutes for it to go away. But if we can sit with it and observe it and just own it. I mean, yesterday, no, not yesterday, a couple of days ago, I had one of those, you know, one of these quarantine days of just by one o'clock, I was done. I had nothing. I was just going around the house, straightening things, starting like six different pro projects. And I realized like, okay, I'm uncomfortable. Stuff is starting to come up a little bit. And my go-to, my drug of choice, if you will, is true crime murder. Podcasts, TV shows, anything that's related to like just, it, but it's got to be true. Serial killers, murder. That's where <laughs> I go to numb out. And I found myself going towards the room. And this is one o'clock in the afternoon. It is way too early for me to get into bed. And I just sat at the edge of the bed, turned the TV on, and I stopped myself and I said, you're going down this rabbit hole. At least own it. Don't like start like just dancing around it. S say to yourself, and I did, I said, yes, I am numbing out. I give up today. This is my drug of choice. I am not in denial, but I'm still going to go there. I am still doing this and no one is going to talk me out of it, but I know I'm avoiding I know I'm bypassing. I know I'm choosing in this moment to disconnect from the bigger feelings that I have coming up. And in that moment, I also said, you've got, I'm going to give, I'm going to, I gave myself three hours and then I'm going to go and sit in meditation and confront it and deal with whatever's coming up. And so my thing, what I often say to people is like, if you're going to pick up that, whatever it might be, at least acknowledge I'm choosing to do this because I'm avoiding my big feelings, but I am in the presence of overwhelm and this is what I'm doing. And maybe the next time then they'll be able to, without shame, say, I'm today going to sit in the discomfort and I'm going to put this down and I'm going to make a different choice. It's when we don't acknowledge or think it should look different is when I think it becomes very problematic for people on the spiritual path. It's this all or nothing. And then this deep shame that happens, especially if we have skills and we think we should know better, that is the biggest conundrum within the practice of spirituality because we're being taught that the pathway opens us to the light, whatever that might mean for someone, a relationship with God, the divine. But yoga also teaches us that everything is connected. That means everything has to be in relationship with the perceived other. There can't be a light without the shadow. So unless I truly embrace my rage, my fear, my jealousy, my grief, I can't truly embrace empathy and compassion and understanding and forgiveness. That the two work in relationship and consort with each other. On the spiritual path, there's so much posturing that goes into the messiness of this evolution that I think people avoid acknowledging their own humanity. And if you can't acknowledge your humanity, how can you be sensitive to someone else when they're in their own disconnect? And so I feel very passionate about holding space for myself and for anyone else when they're in the messiness of this journey, because that is the journey, not thinking that it should look another way, a different way, a better way, that it's that third wave that is the spiritual path. 
And the choices do you do both you'll learn. You either go in, you experience calm, or you turn around. Odds are you'll go into self-beat, excuse making. Those are two good ones that could come up. There's so much spiritual information just in that. If someone welcomes it, where did you learn that? Where has that self-sabotage become part of your narrative since you were a little child? Where did the self-beat come from? So God is all over that process too. So the choice of either going through that third wave or running back to shore, to me, it's both spiritual. It's both holy. It's our perception to those experiences that often pull us into a, uh, that duality of one is good or bad or right or wrong. So many times we'll get the question, well, how do I, let's take athletics again for an example. Like, how do I know when to back off? How do I know when it's me being an excuse or, or me actually being hurt and I, and I need to not work out today? And so I really was com- contemplating this for many months and it just hit me one day. It's, it's not, do you go for the workout or you don't go for the workout? Do you go to the car? Or do you run to the third wave? It's, the belief that we can do the wrong thing. Mm -hmm. It's the belief that we can make the wrong decision. And I think that's what you're saying. There's either way is the spiritual path. Even if we're not aware that we're on the (laughs) spiritual path, that this whole existence is a a school of spirituality. And and we can't, we cannot screw it up. My, my father was a, was an incredible athlete. He was a, um, he went to NC state and he was, um, a very well-known pole vaulter back in the sixties and a runner and super disciplined. And when I was in high school, I was the only girl in an all male track team. And my father was one of my coaches. One of the ways in which my father trained me as an athlete, because I was working with men and being the only girl, my father crying was not ever okay. That was never okay. And so my father used to take my hand. My father adored me, by the way. This was a a training mechanism that he actually thought was helpful, but it actually created a very interesting pattern in my body later on in life. So he would take my hand and he would hold my knuckles, thumb on one side, index finger on the other, and he would have me stare at him in the eye and breathe. And he would stare at me back and he'd slowly squeeze. And he'd say, are you going to cry? Are you going to cry? Are you going to cry? And I would just stare at him, breathe and say, no, no, no. And I could trance myself out of pain, out of sensation. So when I would run and I would get to that point where the sensation in my body was trying to get me to quit or get overwhelmed, In my mind, I learned how to trance myself out of that sensation and not feel anything, no emotion. So I was a very steely athlete. Years later, when I got on the yoga mat, and this was, uh, I don't know how many years, 25 years or so, I, when I would practice at home, I would set egg timers uh, on my mat. And if I made a decision in the morning that I was going to do a four minute warrior two, didn't matter how I was feeling didn't matter what my diet was that day or how I slept or if I was on my cycle. If I made the decision that it was a four minute warrior two, that's what it was going to be. This one particular day, I set my timer, I get into warrior two and I'm breathing and the little voice in my head comes up and says, you're really tired. And right away, focus, breathe, breathe. And another little voice said, you don't need to do this today. You're not feeling that great. It's okay if you only do a minute. And right away is like that that old, you know, just don't cry, don't cry, don't cry, don't cry. I knew that if I just focused and breathed, that I can push through the discomfort that I was experiencing. And this went on back and forth for I don't know how much time, but I was completely dissociated. I was in the pose, but at the same time, not in my body. And I heard as if it was in my room, who are you practicing for? And I remember when I heard that, I dropped to my knees, my body started to shake and I started to cry. And I realized that my sense, my discipline came from such a deep place of that's how I was loved. That's how I affirmed my worthfulness That's how I got approval, acceptance, validated by my community, by other, by men, 
was if I did what I set out to do and didn't react to it, no matter what else was going on in my circumstance, then I was valued. So here I am in the privacy of my own room. No one is here. And that tape still lives in my body. And so I think that that's a conundrum of perhaps a lot of athletes, that they have these narratives embedded in the cells that they can dissociate from that discomfort. So I had to spend years learning how to listen to my body and reaccustom myself to the, to the difference between pain and discomfort. And so as an athlete and as a yoga practitioner, when I'm confronted with pain, I get out of a pose. But when I'm confronted with discomfort and the, the tape comes up of quit, 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 I usually know that there's something emotional within that discomfort that's wanting recognition. But because I am a dissociator, as many people in the yoga community, many people in the world are, I had to go back into what sens- what's the difference of sensation between pain and discomfort. For me, when I experience pain, the sensation is sharp, hot, searing, tearing. Sometimes I can see the color yellow or hot pink, or there's a high pitched tone. That is pain. I get out of a pose. I stop what I'm doing and I take a break. If the sensation is thick, wide, broad, throbbing, tingling, but not sharp, if the colors are more earth tone, or if the tone is wider, then I know that I'm in discomfort and there's something in there that's inviting me into recognition. Because in the practice of yoga, we're taught that our bodies remember everything and it lives within the cells. And if that information is suppressed, like fear, rage, shame, anger, it evolves into the tension we experience. Yoga and a lot of athletics, it helps to decrease that tension and the emotions arise. So pain, learning how to differentiate between pain and discomfort is very individual, but is necessary because one, you will get hurt. The other one, you will evolve. Beautiful words, beautifully articulated and something that we very much teach on our end is, you know, noticing when we're enduring our life, when we're trucking through. Um, And a lot of times when we're enduring and we're trucking through where the mind is, it's wanting another now. It's, It's wanting the moment to change. And I think those moments are so important to stop. But when we're if we're in that sensation and we can still connect to the breath and we can, we, we teach like relaxing in, like, can you relax into, you know, this tempo portion of your run? Can you, can you relax? And if you can't, if you're really like in the gripping and the constricting, this is not what we want to encourage. We're, we're really, we're all really, really good at that, right? How many times one minute heart open, next minute, boom, like, withholding love. It happens so quickly how we can constrict. And uh, I love the way that you described that and related that to athletes. And even if, let's say, because I've been down this road, so I'll speak to my own road. I have, you know, beat myself into injury and I've learned, Mm -hmm. but it wasn't until I beat myself into it enough until I was willing to learn. Mm -hmm. Let's talk about this idea of willingness you know, sometimes we hear like, oh, I'm not ready or they're not ready or they're not ready. And who we truly are, like we're always ready, right? We're, we're always, the soul is, is ready to roll. Are we willing? Mm-hmm. And so we've got the self-will and then we have the, you know, our universal God will, the God will. How important is willingness to this path in, in our dedication and our commitment to remain steadfast? Absolutely. Um, people are in trauma. And I think that that's something that as a core needs to be addressed first before willingness, because willingness could also rep- be representative of a, th- of a threat. Trauma is anything that overwhelms our, our capacity to cope and leaves us feeling helpless, hopeless, out of control, or unable to respond. Um, everyone experiences trauma. We often think of trauma as shock trauma, uh, those big traumas that are unimaginable, but there's developmental trauma. And these are imprints that happen in our youth before we have the ability to assign words 
to those big feelings. So bullying, death of a loved one, divorce, that can be traumatic uh, for a child. When we experience trauma, chemicals released from the brain, cortisol, adrenaline, flood into the body and put us into fight, flight, freeze, or collapse. The moment we experience that trauma and the body contracts in order to create control or safety, in that moment, that narrative has been imprinted within the cellular tissue. And the body now has formed itself around that particular narrative. In yoga, we're taught everything is energy. This mug is energy. It's something that we can see. It's tangible. That's gross energy. But there's subtle energy. Subtle energy, we cannot see it, but we can feel it. That includes joy and happiness and fear, rage, shame, grief, these shadow emotions that are associated with trauma. So in that contraction, the resonance, the vibration of those emotions are now living within my body. If we were raised in an environment that affirms the overwhelm and gives the child a space to fully express themselves safely, where they can scream, yell, cry, beat pillows, they discharge the energy and they're able to finish the process of the overwhelm. But that's not often the way in which we've been raised. We're often raised where a big feeling comes up and parents, again, even with the best of intentions, it's like, oh, you're sad? Here's a cookie. Oh, you're angry? Uh, let's go shopping. I'll buy, let's go get a little present. We're taught ways to self-soothe so we don't actually have to experience the discomfort that lives within ourselves. Now that suppressed energy becomes tension. Tension, stress, and anxiety are the number one causes of illness, depression today. The ways in which we can discharge the energy, yoga, of course, but running, swimming, any form of athletics is a way in which we discharge the energy. But unless, of course, they're working directly with people like you, we're not often taught how to process the emotions. So it's a temporary fix. Same with yoga. And so yoga becomes the drug of choice. Athletics become the drug of choice. And so when you talk about willingness, for someone to be willing to confront the deep layers of suppressed tension, if someone's experienced trauma, it can be actually re-traumatizing. And so hopefully someone finds people who are skilled, like the both of you, who understand the mind-body connection, who understand the deeper connection between athletics or yoga and some of our psychological fractures to just suggest willingness might be a step too quickly. Just learning how to ground and be with breath and sensation is massive. That is like the first step in, and it def definitely requires willingness because suppression is so organic, bypass is organic. All of that is so natural to our nervous system because what's on the other side of that willingness is so much accountability and big feelings and maybe even confrontation that they're not yet ready to have. And so learning how to titrate is very important. And what I mean by that is baby steps, little baby steps on how to, like when I first started teaching yoga, I, I struggle with vertigo. I get very, very dizzy in certain environments. And so uh, when people look directly at me, that's one of my triggers. It used to be one of my triggers. And I didn't understand back then that I was empathic, that I picked up energy and I pick up energy in people's eyes. So that dizziness would cause me to lose my train of thought, which then made me feel stupid, which is a core wound uh, that I'm not smart enough, that I'm a fraud, all, all that stuff. So when I first started learning how to teach, there were so many different ways before I could just get out into the world and stand on a stage and hold a mic and speak extemporaneously. I had to learn how to First, I, I took phonetic lessons to learn how to slow my speech down and articulate my words. And because I was self-conscious about my accent and how, and I, sp I still speak very quickly. I just don't have the same attachment to it that I used to. I had to learn how to make eye contact. I had to learn how to work with the, my nervous system when I would start to feel that dizziness. That was my third wave. And I had to sit with that. And work with, even right now, I'm holding a crystal for grounding. 
So I'm pulling the energy down out of my body. So I titrate my nervous system so that over time, it's like, okay, now I can make eye contact with three people. Let me try six. Let me try 20. Now let me do 100. And that way of getting my nervous system accustomed to this idea that my nervous system believes I'm going to die, that if I confront all this, I'm going to die. That's really where it comes down to. So I've got to prep my nervous system to know, like, actually, you're not going to die. It feels like it, but you're not. So let's slowly start to climb this mountain and get our oxygen and then take the breaks that are necessary before we scale to the top. And so willingness, yes. But with that willingness, patience, surrender, acceptance, a good sense of humor, and forgiveness because you will backtrack again and again and again because it's part of the evolution. There's always another layer. Mm -hmm. yeah. I mean, there's always another layer. Just when you think, okay, I can empty the dustpan, like I've got it all <laughs> in there now, it'll come up. And it'll cut, and sometimes it comes up with a vengeance. Mm -hmm. you know? Yes. That instant forgiveness in yoga teacher training, that was one of the things I remember the first day when you're up there and our teacher would put us up there in front of people and you could see the the snowball effect of everybody like, oh, no, that's the wrong. Like it, you can see it, like you can visually see it. And the, the instant forgiveness was such a connection. Like, okay, so you said the wrong word. Okay, well, now say the right word. Like just continue to float, like keep that momentum moving and have instant forgiveness with yourself. And it's not that you did a bad job or that you're not going to be good at this because that's what your your habit may have been and everybody will jump on board. Oh, you'll get it. You'll get it. No, it's just continually move forward despite mm -hmm. despite whatever happened. It's that instantaneous momentum shift to just keep going forward. And looking at where did you learn that tape? That's a, that go-to. Where did that self-beat come from where you say a wrong word and all of a sudden you are so overwhelmed with shame and humiliation? That's in the body. That's your childhood. And so the gift is it's getting mirrored back even in teaching. And so the opportunity then is to begin the process of transcending it. But you can't change it unless you see it. And that's, again, going back to what is the work? That's the work. Yeah, you can't. I, one of the most profound things I've ever read or heard is like, you can't see it mm -hmm. until you see it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And you can't see it until you practice creating that gap, that pause. For me, it was yoga. Obviously, it became our, our life's work and not only just the way that we live our life, but our life's work. I want to switch gears a little bit. This conversation is so good and I want to encourage everybody to read Revolution of the Soul and also watch the bevy of interviews with Sean so you can get more about her background and everything. I just, I feel like you've talked about that a lot. But one thing I really want to give you a platform for today is talking about veganism, a plant-based diet, uh, its relationship to yoga. And what I would like is if you could share your story, because I know you were vegetarian like in the 80s, and then it was many, many years until you went fully vegan. So, but again, a little bit, right? A little bit every day over a long period of time, eventually we find our way. So I would love for you to just open up and, and share that story with our audience. Sure. I, you know, I grew up in a typical New Jersey town and meat was just a part of our staple diet and felt grateful um, that we were able to afford to eat meat and that that was on the table. And I didn't think twice about it. You know, the chicken nuggets. The nuggets weren't, I didn't see them as chicken. It was a nugget. I didn't see the patty as a cow. It was just a burger. And it wasn't until I moved to New York City. I moved around 17 years old. I worked at a place called Life Cafe, which uh, was run by a man named David Life, who went on to open Jiva Mukti Yoga. And now he and his partner, Sharon, Sharon was a waitress there. They are one of the most dedicated animal rights activists uh, in our nation. So while I was working at Life Cafe, when I first started there, it, was not a, it wasn't even a vegetarian restaurant. David and Sharon started getting very deeply immersed in their yoga practice. David came back from India and made the decision that they were going to turn life into a vegetarian restaurant. And no longer, they, they would use dairy, but that was it. And I remember feeling really put off by this. Like, 
this idea that he was imposing this newfound belief onto every, all, onto me, onto the customers. You know, how was I going to get my protein? That was my big thought. Like, how am I going to get my protein? And not too shortly after that, when David went vegetarian in the restaurant, I was at a friend's apartment and I'm about 18 years old. I'm flipping through a book uh, called In the America West by Richard Avedon. And it was black and white photographs of working class folk throughout the United States, just at work. And I get to this one picture that clearly changed the direct, the trajectory of my whole life, because it is a person wearing coveralls. You can't see their face. And the reason you can't see their face is because they work in a slaughterhouse and they had taken the freshly cut head of a cow and put it over their own head like a mask. And in the photograph, the, t- the cow's eyes are open, the tongue is hanging out, and there's blood coming from the neck onto the body, the human body. And something about this photograph stopped me in my tracks because the juxtaposition between this cow's head over a human body, it suddenly occurred to me that this cow had relationships, had family, new love, new grief, new terror. And by the look in the eye of this animal, new terror, the second it was slaughtered. And that terror was still clearly evident in this animal's eyes. And that was it for me. I never had any, uh, at that time, it was like I was off uh, red meat and never looked back. But I still ate chicken and fish. And I would say it was just a couple of years later where I couldn't justify the chicken. And then I couldn't justify the fish. And then leather. And then finally dairy. It was one thing after another. My brain was a little slow. It was like, wait a second. What's the difference between that chicken and that cow? Or that fish and that cow? But it took, it took a little a, a little while for me to finally eradicate all of it from my habit and from my, and it was a habit. It was an addiction, especially dairy, that just an addiction. And also dairy was difficult to let go of at home. I would be able to practice a vegan diet, but you know, 20 years ago when I was traveling, I mean, I'm still traveling all the time, but then if I had to go teach a workshop in Kansas, If I looked to get a vegan meal at the Holiday Inn in the middle of Kansas, what that would consist of was uh, iceberg lettuce with some shaved carrots on top. And so I couldn't sustain because there weren't whole foods. They, it's not like it is now. And so on the road, I would have to deal with dairy and I'd be like, okay, I'm going to be okay with it on the road, but I, at home, I'm going to be a vegan. Until I couldn't justify that anymore either. And I just had to start bringing my own food with me. And it was very inconvenient. And then the world started to change a little bit. And now there's really no place that I go that I can't and don't have access to really good food. It's amazing how the world has changed. But it definitely took my body a while to let it go, my psyche a while. I've been a vegan for a very, very long time now. And I've also learned how to eat in a way that gives my body what it needs in terms of protein and iron to be able to supplement it. And I think that that's the problem with a lot of people who want to go vegan is that they haven't taken the time to learn how to eat in a balanced way that's nutritious and they're lazy vegans. And then they tell, they come to me and they say, you know, I need my protein and I get anemic. And I said, yeah, I would get anemic too if I was just eating like fake meat every single day and, you know, like processed foods. And it just took a little bit of, it it takes time to break those habits and to learn how to supplement the foods that you crave with other kinds of food that can give you even more nutritional sustenance and satisfy those cravings. And so that's been my, that's been my journey. Being a yoga practitioner also helped to support my commitment to veganism because of the principles of the practice are do no harm. So as a, as a very committed yogi, 
I cannot justify giving love and like, I can't justify being selectively conscious. You know, like I'll give, I'll give love and compassion over here, but I'll turn my back on it over here. I, I've got to be accountable for that. So my yoga practice forced me to have to confront that, those habits, that the laziness and to be really proactive with my commitment around veganism. It's just oddly not a popular endeavor in my community. People are very, very, as you know, get very emotional and very committed to their meat eating. And it's uh, very difficult to be in that conversation, even in the yoga community, without people getting incredibly defensive over those choices. So I just rely on the texts and the texts tell me do no harm. And that's what I choose to do. And that's what I'll teach. I think it was Gandhi that said, you know, the greatness, <clears throat> of course, I'm paraphrasing here, but like the greatness of a nation is, is how we treat our animals. Yes. Mm -hmm. And yeah. I admittedly experienced a little bit of heartbreak at the beginning of all of this. We went to the store and, you know, of course the produce is full and the meat section is empty. Mm -hmm. And yeah. we just put a higher demand on mm -hmm. that industry then I've caught wind that, you know, the government is, you know, going to be purchasing a lot of this meat and dairy. How do you rectify that in your heart? It's, uh, I mean, I process it. It's very, it's very saddening. And I sit with that grief. And my hope is just like everything, that even as a nation, we are in this trance and the trauma that we've been inflicting onto animals and then ingesting that trauma it karmically has a, an effect that I think is very evident in our culture. It's a violent culture, a suppressed culture, a divided culture. And all I can do is live as an example and teach the principles and invite people into a conversation that asks them to take responsibility for the choices that they're making. I do see hope when I see all the different kinds of uh, nut milks being utilized and the like beyond burger, their stock is just going up and up and up. That means people are substituting these, uh, the dairy and the meat for these other products. Now, whether or not, like, I don't know how nutritious necessarily beyond burger is, but still people are seeing that there's alternatives. And so I do try to stay hopeful and it breaks my heart when I know in my, in my soul, that if we want liberation and freedom as a global family, we have to end the oppression that we cause on our animals. Again, it's selectively conscious. I'm not, I can't stand over here and say we are all one and be willing to confront the bias and the prejudice within myself that creates oppression towards a species that looks like me and then perpetuate that oppression on species that I dominate because that's not relationship and it's not yoga. And uh, then I'm the problem. So I try to stay hopeful. Otherwise, I don't think I'd get out of bed. And they see yogis that look emaciated because of their vegan diet, that have no musculature because of their vegan diet. I tell them like, look, at there's nothing emaciated about this 53-year-old woman. There is nothing, there is no loss of musculature because I have chosen not to eat meat. I'm probably healthier and more energized than most because of my diet, um, not in spite of it. Is that one of the biggest things that you've experienced in transitioning to this way of eating is the energy level? I mean, it's hard for me to know because it's been part of my lifestyle for so long and, but I can compare myself to other 53 year old people who don't have the same kind of diet or lifestyle or practice. And I can see that um, it also could be genetics. And so I don't want to discount that as well, but I can't help but think that the diet has a lot to do with vitality and prana, you know, like there's no prana in a piece of meat. Um, it's dead. And there's a ton of prana in my kale. That there's a difference in how I ingest that. Plus, there's no trauma in that kale where there is trauma. If you believe in the mind-body connection, there's trauma in that meat that's going inside of me and that's absolutely going to impact me psychologically 
which then impacts me physiologically. Yeah. I mean, I can look at pictures of me when I was eating tons of cheese. I was a vegetarian, like you, vegetarian for a long, long time, eating lots of cheese. I look way better at 48 than I did at 23. Mm-hmm. Yeah. <laughs> you know, pu- puffy, bloated, mm-hmm. and in a lot of pain, holding a lot of rage. I've heard you talk about uh, your six non-negotiables mm-hmm. in life. And actually, there was a, a seventh yeah. as well. So can you share those? Yeah. My, is it six? Yeah, my seven non-negotiables. I still am, I, I know where you're going with this. Because <laughs> my seventh non-negotiable. Because you're, not, you're not that good at number seven. No, I'm not. <laughs> of, the, of the seven non-negotiables, there are five that are daily. And that's yoga, meditation, prayer, diet, sleep. Those are five daily practices that have to be in alignment. Otherwise, I know that I will deregulate my central nervous system. I will get overwhelmed. I will then be reactive. And when I'm reactive, I'll make choices that will, without a doubt, will create suffering or at least separation in some capacity. And so yoga, meditation, prayer, diet, sleep, Therapy is a weekly, uh, one of the weekly uh, work that I do to make sure psychologically someone is holding space for me and helping me to be accountable for what might be coming up for me emotionally, especially someone who's in the field that I'm in. I've got great information. And when there's great information, there's also the tactic of what's called over-understanding, meaning I can tell you how I feel, but not actually feel it. So it's the great um, bypass. And so I have to make sure, because I have so much information, that I'm actually feeling my feelings and not explaining away uh, my my experience, but actually embodying it. And then the last one is uh, play. And that's the one that I'm, I'm just really not great at. I'm getting better, but it doesn't come as natural for me as, you know, someone else. And I put it on my seven because it's essential. Absolutely essential. So there's a a beautiful soul that just came into this world not too long ago, a little baby. Is she helping you with this play? I I think so. It's a little too soon to tell. How old is she? She's just what, like a month or? No, uh, a little less than three months. Three months. Less than three months. And I imagine that yes. I mean, I'm already speaking in octaves higher than I normally would and expressing myself in in unusual ways. But yes, I do believe that without a doubt, I'm going to have no choice but to have to go into that joyfulness, that different level of playfulness that's going to organically be introduced into my life that in benefit to this child, I will have to meet um, regardless of my comfort level or not, because that's just the way that it is. And and it includes just going out on hikes, adventures, dancing with friends, going out to dinner, going to movies. I just don't, I just don't do those things. I'm just more serious minded in that way. And every time I do though, I'm reminded a how fun I am, that I'm fun and joyful and ecstatic, that these are parts, these are archetypes that are alive in me in the same way I'm serious and passionate and uh, assertive that I need to bring life into those equally. And so that's why I I force myself to have to uh, get out of uh, isolation, which is ironic because the isolation actually works very well for my nervous system, but force myself to have to engage with the world outside of teaching that brings joy and silliness. So I recommend play even though I don't do it well. And, you know, engaging with the world is a very important piece of our spiritual practice because, you know, I was just reading in the Bhagavad Gita, um, you know, about renunciation versus like karma yoga, right? So like taking action and, and being in service and that we get a lot of work done here in this society of ours. Although sometimes I do want to just take a jet plane up to the Himalayas and Mm -hmm. set up camp for the rest of my life in one of those caves. We do get a lot of opportunity throughout the day to rise up, to wake up, to see, to get into that space. The path uh, of our lives, whether we believe it to be a spiritual path or not, can you speak to just the opportunities that we get to wake up 
from our pain, that that's kind of a part of our process, part of our life process that is being organized in this higher level. I, I mean, I believe so strongly that all of us are are here to wake up. Just the rate in which that happens is very unique to each individual and the God of their own understanding and is very dependent upon their own karma. And but we're all on but we're all on this path. It just is funky and weird and ecstatic and some days effortless and some days super craggy um, and un- and often uncomfortable. But we are all there. The privilege that some of us, not all of us had, our access to tools that can help guide us and give us the necessary information to affirm the challenges and the discomfort. Some people on this planet are just trying to survive and don't have the means or the access to tools like yoga or meditation or thought leadership, which is something that like it, it breaks my heart, but it also, I recognize that that is true, that what we get to do like this right now, that this is privilege. And we're all on this path that's magnetizing us forward. And whether it happens in this lifetime or another lifetime, I don't know. That's, again, between each soul. What I do know is that I will never take this for granted, that personally, that I will take advantage of these tools, I will commit to these tools, and I will help to the best of my capacity to provide these tools to others, especially those who are underserved in our community who don't necessarily have access, if it's appropriate. And be very pra- patient with this process because I believe that spirit gives you gives you what is necessary for your own personal evolution and that it is very, very unique and that all of it, even if on my end, I might look at someone else and think, oh my God, they are so unconscious. I also have to recognize that they are exactly where they're supposed to be in this moment, learning the necessary lessons that are going to transport them in time when their nervous system and psyche become more integrated. It just on my end looks like, come on, like let, let's wrap this up already. But then what they're mirroring back to me is my judgment. And so that spirit's way of saying, oh, really? You're so, you know, you're so enlightened and you know, look at you. And so I try to stay on my own side of the street, utilize the tools, provide the tools, recognize the ways in which I stand in judgment or assumption towards someone else, and also simultaneously recognize that the spiritual path itself is not a privilege, that that's accessible to all. But the tools that allow us access into that more sophisticated mode of understanding, that is privileged. And so I want to make sure that we, like even podcasts like this, that there's going to be an athlete that's on this podcast who's going to hear something in a very, very different way that actually might impact the way in which they experience their own trauma. They're then going to go home and maybe read a book. That book is going to influence the way they choose to raise their children. And so I might not have a sense of the impact, or we might not have a sense of the impact our words um, have. And yet our commitment to being as authentic to those words and to our own path is intrinsic to the collective waking up. So when I look at this idea that, yes, we are all waking up, I have to remind myself every day that all of us are a piece of this energetic puzzle, if you will. No one person is more important than, than another and everyone is necessary. My job is to recognize I'm in service to something bigger than my individual ego, and that I got to get out of my own way and confront my own shadow so that I can merge and open to uh, that space of grace within, because then I'll see it in someone else. And that's how this world changes. But we are all on this, this evolutionary path. At least that's how I, that's what I carry with me. Yeah. So someone listening to this, they're going to be inspired. I can tell you they're going to they're going to, you know, they're going to feel a tug at their heart and someone who maybe isn't on the path yet. You know, we're all moving that way, but they're not they haven't boarded the train yet. What's what's something looking back at your life and seeing where you are now, something maybe you would have recommended to your to your younger self of how you can maybe dip your toes into moving forward cuz you know, I wish I had someone that would maybe just give me a little tip or a little hint. And I know it's the process and you've got to be willing and 
and um, you got to be all in. And this is something you really need to do if you want the true change. But how can you begin maybe to push that rock down the hill to, to build some momentum? Trusting the process is very important and being patient, knowing that the messiness is an essential part of the pathway. But I also know that when I first started doing yoga, it was purely a physical experience for me. It was not emotional and it certainly wasn't spiritual. I was an atheist. I just wanted to feel healthier in my body. And I was that person who did those extra push-ups. I was the person who would rip up the mat before Shavasana because I couldn't tolerate just sitting there. I had to get on with my day until one day, just in a yoga pose, the sensation became so intense that all this emotion that had been so internalized and suppressed came pouring out of me. I could easily look back at those eight years prior and be like, I wasn't really doing yoga. But the truth was my physical body was so tense because of my trauma that it took eight years of physical practice, just chipping away at the tension from one angle to another to another until my nervous system finally felt comfortable enough to penetrate that tension and reveal the next layer, which was emotional, which then eventually moved towards spirit. But it was a long drawn out process. But I look with so much gratitude to those first eight years. I was being prepped. It was an essential part of this evolution. But to someone else's eye, they would have thought that I was like, oh, she's just here to get a better butt. Yeah, I was. I didn't know what it was also going to do was open my heart. Um, I wasn't prepared for that. So my hope is anyone who's listening, just trust. If they're listening to you, they're already aware that there is more to their inner life than they've been able to articulate openly because you're affirming what they already know inside their soul. There's nothing that we're saying that people don't know, but fear, trauma, overwhelm, ego, block that light. When what they're hearing, it's little seeds being planted where they know, but they don't know yet. And my hope is like, be patient, enjoy this ride. You're going to look back and wish for those years of unconsciousness because <laughs> 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 Once you start to wake up, it's it gets even more uncomfortable and weirder. And so I hope that they trust themselves that if they're paying attention to conversations like this, they're already being magnetized forward. And so just breathe, be at ease, go into places of stillness, celebrate the messiness and trust that there is something way bigger going on than that firm butt or those loose hamstrings. And if they can stay with it, it's these practices move us past the body and into a deeper relationship with God, the, but God that's already within. And that's when this shit gets good. <laughs> Perfect. <laughs> Beautiful. Beautifully said. And if you guys want to practice with Sean, I actually downloaded your, um, from seancorn.com, downloaded a practice this morning and did that before our interview while I was had the voice in, in my head saying, you really need to be preparing. You, re, you know, following her since the 1990s is not enough. Like you really need to be, you should listen to another podcast. You should read back through the, what you wrote for the intro to and I was like, what better way to prepare for my podcast with Sean than to practice yoga with Sean? And it was so beautiful. So thank you for that gorgeous practice and for uh, helping me once again shine the light on blind spots, uh, which yoga just continues to do. And people like you will uh, continue to hold that light for us. And like I say, never dim it. Don't lose that accent. Don't lose that East Coast <laughs> edge. It's it's all makes you your in your individuality. And you know, as you know, we need you. We need you to be more of you, just like we need BJ to be more of BJ and me to be more of me, so that we can recognize that we are all the same. Yeah, right on, right on. Yeah, thank you for that. Read Sean's book or listen to Sean's book, Revolution of the Soul. Gosh, you can just put in her name, S-E-A-N-E-C-O-R-N, -E and you will get plenty of resources. Really, really grateful for your time today. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you both so much. I enjoyed this conversation thoroughly, truly. It touched my heart. So thank you. God bless. God bless. <laughs>